There's a common misconception in the general public that science is the bearer of all truth and that whatever scientists say really is so. I'd like to talk today about this issue of science, particularly science doesn't say anything scientists do. What they're finding is, is that ever since about 1980, there's been an increase in scientists going beyond the data. They are politicizing the data. They are saying things like, science says we must, science says we should, science tells us we must, science tells us we should, science commands, science requires, science dictates, science compels. Look at this, coming up to this current year, 2010. The one that is, uh, it looks like the most prevalent is this idea, oh, that's the total. Uh, science tells us we should. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists, we have to interpret the data and make an interpretation from that point. But these individuals are getting authoritative, as if there's some sort of cosmic science god out there who tells us how we're supposed to live. In other words, it's gotten moralistic and politicized. As I mentioned to you yesterday, I had an atheist at A&M, a biology student, who after the seminar during the Q&A, uh, we were going back and forth and I finally said to him, I said, what is the origin of information, information itself? And he said, that's not my field. I said, that's exactly the problem. You can't grant yourself information and then once you grant your, your, yourself all these impossibilities, it seems, then take your worldview from that point up and say everything fits. No, you've got to explain all the data, not just the data in your little world view. We're not finding unity and diversity anymore as we used to at universities. We're staying in our own little narrow world view. We don't understand philosophy anymore. We don't understand how these other disciplines impact the whole overall rubric of truth. We don't understand that we zero in on this one little thing and we miss the big picture. It's so what about DNA similarity? Well, let's talk about it. We do have common DNA among different creatures. And it is true that DNA similarity is about 96% between apes and humans. But you know, it's also about 90% between mice and humans. In fact, because of the complex ways cells use genetic information, very small genetic differences can produce big functional differences. But that's not even the main point. I mean, it, it could be 99% us and apes, 99.999, whatever you want to call it, and that wouldn't necessarily mean we had a common ancestor. Why not? Because DNA similarity could be evidence of a common designer rather than a common ancestor. Similar structures often have a similar blueprint. Have you guys ever seen this illustration? Have you seen this picture? Darwinist Tim Barra put it out. He offered the progression of the Corvette as evidence of descent with modification. Look at the 1953 Corvette and the 1963, then up to the 1968 and then the 1978. You can see the progression there. That's evolution right there, baby. What's the problem with the illustration? Yes, it's now known as Barra's blunder because this is evidence of intelligent design. There's intelligent designers who did this. In fact, when Dr. Geisler had his debate with Paul Kurtz a number of years ago on the John Ankerberg show, uh, Kurtz offered the, the, an illustration from the Wright Brothers plane to the modern Boeing 747. And Geisler said, but who did that? That was done by intelligent designers, not some random process. And he kept persisting with the illustration. And Geisler finally said, stop using that. You're helping my argument. <laughs> <laughs> because he was. <laughs> Go ahead, Greg. Just an insertion that goes back to something that we talked about yesterday in argumentation here. Uh, strictly speaking, uh, this is not evidence for design, nor was it evidence for evolution. It is merely an illustration. Illustrations aren't evidence. So when Barra puts this up, illustrating natural progression, he is using a designed, a designed thing to illustrate uh, allegedly a natural progression. So he's using the wrong kind of illustration and really it's an illustration of design, not evidence of design, but an illustration of design. But it, it underscores the point that illustrations are not arguments. There is no evidence of any kind in this picture. All it is showing is a picture of a concept. But it passes in the minds of many 
as evidence because you can give a powerful illustration. So keep this in mind. Again, I'm going to underscore what I said yesterday. Illustrate, uh, uh, alternate explanations are not arguments, and all illustrations are are sophisticated alternate explanations. Just because they can illustrate the point powerfully doesn't mean they've given powerful evidence for the point being illustrated. Let's go back to our question. Is Barra just seeing what he wants to see? Of course! And that's a great point, Greg. It's not evidence, it's an illustration. Is he seeing what he wants to see? That's what he's seeing. He's just seeing what he wants to see. Also, with regard to DNA similarity, Darwinists must explain the vast dissimilarity between living things. They have to explain how the bee, the octopus, the Venus flytrap, mildew, peacock, the porcupine, and the human are all, are all somehow related by some sort of natural process without intelligence. Look at, look at the dissimilarity, not just the similarity. Notice that one of the main arguments here, the main arguments that they're bringing forth is called homology, similarity. Well, that is an equally good argument for a common designer. In other words, it's a wash here. They don't get anywhere with this, with this assertion. They're interpreting the evidence that it's common ancestry when it could easily be interpreted as common design. Doesn't get anyone anywhere to talk about similarity. How different would we need to be in order for them to say, you know, we're too different to, be, to have been related? Well, I think an octopus is a lot different from a Venus flytrap. <laughs> right? Mildew is a lot different from a porcupine. But they're saying, oh, no, they're all related. You know, there's hardly anything written on about plant evolution. But according to the Darwinist, plants are evolved too. How so? No idea. Let's give you the entire quote from Dawkins. Now, I gave you the first sentence in his exchange with Philip Johnson. Here's the entire quote. Check this out. The reason we know for certain we are all related, including bacteria, is the universality of the genetic code and other biochemical fundamentals. My philosophical commitment to materialism and reductionism is true, but I would prefer to characterize it as a philosophical commitment to a real explanation as opposed to a complete lack of explanation, which is what you espouse. <laughs> Man, he's giving away the store here, isn't he? He's saying it's true, my philosophical commitment to materialism and reductionism. Well, if materialism is what he believes, and materialism is true, he ought not believe it. Why? Because he can't know truth if materialism is true. Again, it's self-defeating. Go back to our quote with Crick. Remember when Crick said, the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your thoughts, your feelings, your dreams are just a, a bungle of, of nerve endings, basically, just molecules in motion? Well, that's, then his thought right here is just molecules in motion. His thought about the universality genetic code is just molecules in motion. He doesn't really have free will. He doesn't have the ability to choose. He doesn't have the ability to know truth. It's just chemicals firing. He's ruling out intelligence beforehand. He's begging the question. He's assuming what he's trying to prove. Science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. And that's what he's saying right here. All right, microevolution. Microevolution. In 2004, by the way, by the way, uh, I just had an email exchange with Jonathan Wells yesterday. I don't know if you know Jonathan Wells. He wrote the uh, book, Icons of Evolution. He's at the Discovery Institute. A very, very clear thinker on, he has a PhD in biology from UCAL Berserkley. I think he has another PhD from somewhere else. Anyone know where Wells? He's got two PhDs. He's, he's like uh, Dembski. He's forgotten more than I'll ever know. Brilliant guy. Uh, and he, I was emailing him because I heard him say recently there's, there's just a couple of categories that evolutionists make, or a couple of categories into which you could place the arguments that they make. And the two categories he mentioned are homology, the one we just went through, and the second is microevolution. When you unpack or when you cut through all the fog that the evolutionists try and put forth as to evidence, you can put them into those two categories. It's a similarity argument or it's a micro to macro argument. That's it, basically. Okay, that's their evidence. Well, let's take a look now at the micro argument. In 2004, you may have seen this edition. In fact, I have this edition at home. National Geographic came out with a entire edition, Was Darwin Wrong? That was the cover. You remember this? What, what, what conclusion do you think they made? 
<laughs> Gee, no surprise there, right? Was Darwin wrong? Well, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. These scientists said, no, Darwin wasn't wrong. Here was their main evidence, and I'm not making this up. When you go inside the, the magazine, this is what you will see. This is their main evidence. Is that a bulldog? Why is that their evidence, do you think? Why would they put a bulldog up there? Here's why. They're saying that dog breeding is an example of evolution. Dog breeders can breed dogs as small as a Chihuahua and as large as a Great Dane, right? They can get a lot of variation in the, in the, the genetic code of dogs to get a lot of that variation there. They can get all those different types of dogs. And so what they're saying is that we can do this in a very short period of time, this breeding. We can do it in a very short period of time. So macroevolution over a long period of time can go much further. In other words, they're extrapolating from micro into macro. Now, if anyone ever asks you, do you believe in evolution, what should your first question be? Hint, it's tactic one. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by evolution? Because there's at least two distinctions or two different types you need to talk about. If you're talking about micro, I'm with you. Yeah, I see micro. Micro happens all the time. And the ability of a, of a particular type of uh, creature to adapt itself to its environment. Yeah, no problem. Okay? See it all the time. But if you're talking about macro, I don't think you can extrapolate from micro to macro. But they say we can. You know why we can? Because if breeding in a short period of time can do this, then macroevolution over a long period of time can do that. Or natural selection over a long period of time can do macroevolution. Here's the problem. Here's the big but. But if intelligent breeding meets genetic limits, then how can non-intelligence exceed them? I mean, here we are with all our intelligence. These breeders try and breed all these dogs, but they run into genetic limits. They can go small as a chihuahua and as large as a Great Dane, but they can't go beyond those limits. There appear to be limits. And using all our intelligence, we run into limits. So why should we expect non-intelligence to exceed them? You say, well, we just need more generations. Tried it. Done it with E. coli bacteria, 40,000 generations. There's a guy at the University of Pittsburgh, I think, that's been doing this for 25 or 30 years. What does he have now? E. coli bacteria. Tried it with fruit flies, because they, they have very short lifespans. Many generations, fruit flies. What do we have now? Mutant fruit flies. OK, they're still fruit flies. Some of them have wings coming out of their heads. They're not advantageous mutations. We still have fruit flies, and we're using our intelligence to try and manipulate them, and we still can't break the genetic barriers. Greg. Yeah, something, something might be said here uh, about the problems with even microevolution, because I, I think it's fair to acknowledge that microevolution happens, but when you get closer to the details themselves, there's some significant question whether even in so-called microevolution, whether or not you actually ever get any, any, any new or uh, novel new. features. Or new information. New information. Yeah. What you get is a restructuring of things, or, or rather a, an expression of things that are already there and may already be manifest in the populations, but in such a small amount, you don't notice it. So when you have the famous case of the, uh, the peppered moth in England, you have the melanic variety, the darker variety, and the white. Those varieties always existed in mm -hmm. the population. Mm -hmm. It's just that the force of, of the environment through natural, uh, natural selection changed the relative numbers of the population. It didn't create one thing into another thing. So strictly speaking, there is no evolution even of a micro nature going on there, mm. there is natural selection that's changing the relative densities of population. And so it gives the impression that there is an evolution to one variety and then an evolution back to the other variety uh, when the, the conditions changed there in England after the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is true with the finch's beak mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. the famous Dar Darwin's finches that, uh, that have the larger beak and the smaller beak. Again, y you have no novel information that's being caused by some Darwinian mechanism. What you have is a change in population size through natural selection, certainly, but only a change in population size, not actual evolution, not introduction of novel features even on a micro level. So the idea of microevolution, we can kind of give the nod to, but even then we're, we're giving more credit right, than is right. due given the evidence. Exactly. Well said. That's often overlooked. 
What we are saying is there is a certain sense of microevolution going on, but not macroevolution. As Greg just pointed out, it's really not change. It's a change in proportion of the given population. In fact, Darwin's finches, after, the, the proportion of, of uh, long beak to short beak, beak finches changed with the weather changes. Right. You know, when drought, I think they had longer beaks to go deeper, and when you had a uh, wet season, they had shorter beaks because they didn't need to go as deep in order to, but what, what changed was just the proportion of the long beak to short beak finches. It didn't, you, they didn't get anything Nothing other than well. finches. And by the way, as Philip Johnson points out, what's often overlooked is, where did the finches come from to begin with, <laughs> right? He says, natural selection can help explain the survival of the species, but not the arrival. Where did they come from to begin with? All right, how about molecular machines? Molecular machines, take a look at this. As you've probably seen this quote, according to Charles Darwin, uh, Darwinism's dead. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight changes, my theory would absolutely break down. And of course, sort of the mascot of the intelligent design movement is the bacterial flagellum. And if you take a look at the bacterial flagellum, it's the width of an E. coli bacterium cell, which is uh, about one one thousandth the width of a human hair. So you can line up 12,500 in an inch of these things. It has 240 distinct proteins. It has a microscopic outboard motor on its tail that runs at an incredible 100,000 revolutions per minute. This is a little motor here. And it only takes a quarter turn to stop, shift directions, and start spinning 100,000 RPMs in the opposite direction. I don't even know if we have a motor that can do that ourselves. And it's irreducibly complex. It must have been created all at once because you can't have function of a motor as it's being put together. The whole motor needs to be there at the same time in order for you to have function. Yeah, you can build a car in successive steps, but you can't drive your car when it's halfway built, right? And Ken Miller and other so-called uh, critics of this will try and say they have a precursor to this, but they really don't. They don't have a functional precursor to this. In fact, when you look at this, if this isn't something engineered, I don't know what is. You've got a propeller, you've got bushings with L-rings, P-rings, you've got membranes, hooks, universal joints, you've got a rotor with an S-ring and an M-ring, you've got studs, a stator, you've got all this stuff, which is really an engineered creation. It's not something that could come into existence. And can, can you define irreducible complexity for us so we, oh, yeah, okay. we, we, we see why this is uh, so critical to the Darwinian enterprise? An irreducibly complex system or creation, whatever it is, whatever you're talking about, has to have all the parts in working order at the right place at the right time in order to have function. Uh, the, the, the illustration that Michael Behe gives is the mousetrap, right? You've got to have all five parts of the mousetrap there in order to catch mice. Uh, yeah, you could have a precursor to a mousetrap, but it wouldn't catch mice if you took some of the parts away. You need to have all the parts there in working order together at the same time in order to have function. Do you have a different definition? That no, no, it's just because mm -hmm. the Darwinian model requires that uh, each piece be added little by little and at each stage you have increased functionality. Yes. With irreducible complexity, you have functionality at no stage of the building of the thing until you have the whole thing built. So when you have a bona fide irreducibly complex feature in the biological realm, there is no Darwinian way to explain how the pieces get assembled to the functional state. And what uh, guys like Miller want to say is that there must be some functionality to the preliminary states mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that then, uh, then, then leads you to this final sophisticated state we see here. But of course, Th there must be only if you're presuming the materialistic explanations. If you're going with the evidence as, it, as we're facing it, we are free then to just uh, deposit the most obvious explanation, this is designed. They are not free to do that because they are restricted by their philosophical presuppositions, so they have to demand that there must be uh, some functionality to these prior stages, and this is the demand that they force upon the argument mm -hmm. to disqualify the, uh, the conclusions of irreducible complexity. Now, a conclusion of an irreducibly complex system is what Michael Behe takes, because he wrote the book on this, and here's what he says. 
He says the result of these cumulative efforts to investigate the cell, to investigate life at the molecular level, is a loud, clear, piercing cry of design. The result is so unambiguous and so significant that it must be ranked as one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. The discovery rivals those of Newton and Einstein. Now, is he just seeing what he wants to see? I'll let you decide that. Science doesn't say anything scientists do. I think he's drawing the proper conclusion based on the evidence, but that's for you to decide. Question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I, you want me to go back there? <clears throat> there is, uh, it, it, it's not unusual to hear people say that Behe has been completely refuted on this point. And when you look at the details, what you discover is that someone has taken an example of alleged irreducible complexity and then they have contrived an explanation, and it may be a clever explanation that is worth looking into. I'm not dismissing it. But they've contrived an explanation how that particular piece of machinery can be explained by some kind of step-by-step -step process in which each step has uh, functionality. It's a possibility, in, but it's not evidence. It, well, it's a possibility, yeah, and that's okay because yeah. scientists right. have to do that. That's part of what they do. They, they tell stories and then try to find uh, evidence that the story, that things played out the way they think they do. So I'm not faulting the process. I'm making a little different point. Let's even just say for the sake of discussion that they have done a, a convincing job of giving us a materialistic explanation to demonstrate that one alleged example of irreducibly, ir irreducible complexity is not, in fact, irreducibly complex. But then they take that to be a refutation of the entire point and every example of irreducibly complex machines in the biological realm. I've seen this time and time again. Oh, he's been completely disproved. How so? Well, because this uh, flagellum thing, well, we found a way to explain that in Darwinian terms. So there he goes. As if the flagellum is the only mm -hmm. example of mm -hmm. an irreducibly complex thing. Mm -hmm. And as B.E. points out, and the people in the field know, the biological realm is absolutely littered with these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. In every single cell you see these kinds of things. And uh, just in, in the replication process of the DNA and how, how the DNA uh, helps make proteins, assemble proteins, there's all kinds of little machines that are involved in that process. And by explaining away one of the machines in this vast array of them, you have not defeated the argument of irreducible complexity. You've just removed, supposedly, one example of irreducible complexity. You know, William Dembski makes the point that the irreducible complexity argument on steroids is the origin of life. Because for the origin of life, you need a cell you need DNA, you need RNA, and you need proteins. And all four of those things need one another. They have to all be there together to have any of them in a living thing. Uh, DNA needs RNA, RNA needs DNA, a cell needs both of them, proteins need, they, they, all, they all go together. It's a chicken, and, a classic chicken and egg problem. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the irreducible complex problem on steroids. That's why even Dawkins will just speculate on the beginning, the origin of life. Uh, but then when you look at how life functions here and you're trying to reverse engineer things, interesting word, reverse engineer, right? <laughs> <laughs> this stuff's engineered. You're trying to figure out how is it put together by randomness. I think the, ultimately it's futile to try and figure that out because it doesn't appear to be put together by randomness. Now, by the way, before we go into the fossil record, last thing, can you continue to look for a natural cause for life? Yeah, you can continue to look for it if you want to. But when does a question become closed? At what point do you finally say, look, we've been looking long enough. When are we going to finally say it, information doesn't appear to have any natural cause, natural forces, all the natural forces we know just create repetitive things over and over again. When are we going to finally admit that there's got to be intelligence introduced somewhere, somehow, in this process? Bow. <laughs> huh? When every knee will bow. When every knee will bow, maybe. That's it. I don't know. But based on the information we have now, the best explanation is there was intelligence put in it at some point. Mm -hmm. and can I underscore something Please. that you that you implicit you implied here, mm -hmm. and this is something that Stephen Meyer makes as a very, very strong point. The task here isn't just looking around a little bit longer to see if we can find the right stuff. It has to do with the nature of the enterprise itself. 
uh, biochemical predestination is dead in the water because it can't produce information. They know that. So there's only a couple of avenues that the materialist can go that he has at disposal to explain information. And it turns out that the nature of information itself cannot be explained by those kinds of things. And so you run into a dead end because, not because, uh, well, I haven't yet found the little piece of information to explain it. It's because of the kinds of things that you're trying to bring together. So could we say, Greg, in your opinion, that this is a category mistake? Yes. That it, it's, it's a, um, it's not a the God of the gaps argument anymore either because nature itself can't explain immaterial realities known as... It, it, Exactly. Okay. You're, you're trying to find a materialistic explanation for the existence of immaterial stuff, information, which your philosophy, first of all, can't explain how you get something immaterial from something material, but it also, your philosophy, denies the existence of immaterial things to begin with. That's right. <laughs> so so it's, it's just in principle not mm -hmm. capable of solving this problem. But then, just like that, the atheist could be right. <laughs> that's what he's famous for saying. That's not me. That's Tom. Is that Tom? Yeah, that's Tom. No, I think you're right on it. It's just, it's a different category. It's like trying to find a, a natural cause for all of nature. Trying to find a natural cause for information when we know information's immaterial. Last thing, fossil record. Again, we interpret the data via philosophy. Let's go back to Stephen Jay Gould, perhaps one of the more famous evolutionists who died about 10 years ago. He taught at Harvard. He said this, modern multicellular animals make their first uncontested appearance in the fossil record some 570 million years ago. And with a bang, not a protracted cre uh, crescendo, this Cambrian explosion marks the advent, at least into direct evidence, of virtually all the major groups of modern animals and all within the minuscule span, geologically speaking, of a few million years. In other words, there, you know, there are fewer phyla now than there were at the Cambrian explosion. <laughs> exactly opposite to what you think with regard to Darwinism. Here is a clip from Darwin's Dilemma, which is a phenomenal DVD. If you guys don't have it, I think we may have some back at the house. We'll bring them in. Take a look at this clip. This explains the Cambrian explosion very quickly. But late in the Precambrian, they disappeared from the Earth. Then long after their extinction, everything changed in a geological instant. In a spectacular burst of creativity, the basic blueprints for most of the animal kingdom exploded into being. And for the first time, Biologically complex structures like compound eyes, spinal cords, articulated limbs and skeletons appeared on Earth. To understand the speed of the Cambrian explosion, imagine the history of life compressed into a single day. If we imagine the whole history of life on Earth taking place in one 24-hour period, the current uh, Standard estimates for the origin of life put it at about 3.8 billion years ago, let's say 4 billion. So if we start the clock then, our 24-hour clock, six hours, nothing but these simple single-celled organisms appear, the same sort that we saw in the beginning. 12 hours, same thing. 18 hours, same thing. Three quarters of the day has passed, and all we have are these simple single-celled organisms. Then at about the 21st hour, in the space of about two minutes, boom, most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. And many of them persist to the present, and we have them with us today. Less than two minutes out of a 24-hour period. That's how sudden the Cambrian explosion was. I love that illustration, because I think it brings it right down to home, two minutes at about 9 o'clock at night or 9.30 at night. Uh, Gould went on to say this, that it does not support gradualism. The history of most fossil species includes two features particularly inconsistent with gradualism. Here's what he said. Stasis, most species exhibit no directional change during their tenure on Earth. They appear in the fossil record looking much the same as when they disappear. Morphological change is usually limited and directionless. And then he goes on to say sudden appearance. In other words, they come together all at once, fully formed. 
So that's exactly the opposite of what we would say Darwinism is. They, they come in immediately and they leave immediately and they don't change as long as they're here on Earth. Another quick clip from Darwin's Dilemma. Check this out. Imagine a graph, if you will, of the appearance over time of phyla. In Darwin's picture, you'd have one, then two, then four, perhaps, then eight, a gradually increasing curve of the number of phyla growing over time. What you actually have in the fossil record is a sudden spike in the number of phyla that appear during the Cambrian, and then a few that trickle in uh, across the rest of geologic time. This kind of discontinuity is radically at odds with the Darwinian picture of the history of life. The pattern we see is the major body plans present at the beginning, and that the organisms that we know today fall into one or another of those major body plans. They don't gradually increase over time. Uh, so the fossil record does not support gradualism. It does not support Darwinism. You saw the spike there? I mean, that's, that's how, according to the fossil record, these creatures have come into existence, just in spikes, the big spike, the Cambrian explosion, and then a couple of little spikes later on, but not this sort of progression from a few to many. Uh, we'll stay with Gould here, who said this, the extreme rarity of the transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the, straight, as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Let's go back to National Geographic. I can't believe they put this in here. But this is literally, this is a quote from the story. Here's what it says. Illuminating but spotty, the fossil record is like a film of evolution from which 999 of every 1,000 frames have been lost on the cutting room floor. Can you believe that? Can you imagine if you pay to go see a movie and they show you one frame of every thousand? First of all, the movie's 12 seconds long. Do you go, you walk out of there going, man, that was great. I got the plot. I got, you know, you would go, what? Here's my question. What would the fossil record look like if ID, if intelligent design is true? What would it look like? Like it does. I think like it does, right? Now, you could say every one, every thousand might give you a progression if you fill in the gaps in your mind right? Or, and, and how are they filling in the gaps? They're filling in the gaps because we look like, say, other primates. And they're, they're assuming that there are transitions there. Well, that's the very question. They're assuming what they're trying to prove. And in fact, it's been said elsewhere, Jonathan Wells makes this point, you cannot make and Michael Denton does too, you cannot make ancestral relationships or determine an ancestral relationships from fossils anyway. You can't. 99%, Denton makes this point, 99% of what we know about a biological creature is in its soft tissue. It's not in its fossil remains. Hmm. And so you can't even make ancestral connections by the fossil record. But even when they try, they're out of ammunition, intellectual ammunition. Here's macroevolutionary theory. Watch this. Here's the true picture. <laughs> now, there aren't missing links. There's a missing chain. If I have a link in New York, a link in Chicago, and a link in LA, do I have a missing chain or, a missing, or missing links? I have a missing chain. There's no chain there. The basic body plan of the arthropod phylum has a segmented torso, jointed legs, and an exoskeleton, all of which arose suddenly at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion. And today we still see the continuity of this original plan, this foundational idea in over a million species of animals. This top-down pattern looks nothing like the predictions of Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory is that there's a tree of life where you have one organism diverging into many other organisms and big differences appearing at the top. What we really see is from here up. This does not exist in the fossil record. If I were using a botanical illustration, it would be a lawn with separate blades of grass sprouting independently of each other. And those would be the phyla. 
Now within each phylum, there is subsequent diversification, but even there, I don't see the branches connecting that would make them a tree of life. Darwin was caught in the grip of a deep dilemma. The fossil record showed him one thing, his theory told him something else. He comes to an impasse at this point, and he says, if this pattern holds, it is a genuine argument against my view. And I think 150 years later, uh, we've added a great deal more detail to the picture, but I think the basic problem is still unsolved. Still unsolved. What is the implication of this? Richard Dawkins will tell us. Here it is. Without gradualness, we are back to a miracle. That's why he went after Stephen Jay Gould, because Stephen Jay Gould came up with the punctuated equilibria theory, which said that evolution took these jumps. He had no mechanism by which he, he could show evidence for this, but he just said it must be. Why? Because philosophically, he's already decided evolution's true. So evolution wasn't gradual in his view. It took these hopeful monster jumps somehow. No evidence for this. He's just back his philosophy or assuming his philosophy before he looks at the evidence and therefore comes up with that last thing from Dawkins here we already read this earlier he does have a philosophical commitment to materialism and reductionism which again means he's ruling out intelligence beforehand he's begging the question he's assuming what he's, pri what he's trying to prove and he is falling right into what Einstein said, that unfortunately the man of science is a poor philosopher. All right, let's go back to Flew, who famously said, follow the evidence where it leads. Who is Anthony Flew? He was the philosophical atheist of the last century, probably the most prominent one, who wrote the article for atheism in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and in 2005 became kind of a theist, maybe a deist, but he rejected atheism because of the DNA argument, basically, intelligent design. And he always said, even when he was an atheist, we got to follow the evidence where it leads. Where does it lead? It appears to lead back to an intelligent designer. Does science say that? No, scientists say that. That's what I'm saying. I think that's what the evidence shows. Now, I could be wrong. Here's the big so what. Last thing. Richard Lalonde, an atheist, teaches at Harvard. He's an atheist, a Marxist, a Darwinist, all the ists, okay? In 1997, he had a very honest moment when he wrote in the New York Times Review of Books why he and his fellow colleagues don't believe in miracles. He said, it's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, meaning our prior adherence to material causes, to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Materialism is absolute. We can't allow God in. Why not? Why can't they allow God in? Well, if God gets in, no longer are they seen as the new priests who dispense truth to the general public. No longer will they be able to get grant money from the major institutions and from the United States government. No longer will they be seen as buddies with their materialistic colleagues if they let God in. And ultimately, they're going to have to bow their knee to a creator because God brings with him moral restraints. Ron Carlson, who speaks at a lot of college campuses, said once he went into a college campus situation, he was speaking at the invitation of a biology professor, talking about the problems with Darwinism, and after the lecture was over, he had lunch with the professor, and he said to the professor, what do you think of my lecture? And the professor said, well, Ron, what I think you say is true, but I'm going to keep teaching Darwinism anyway. And Ron said, why would you do that? And the professor said, because if Darwinism is true, if we did evolve from slimy green algae, without intelligent intervention, if there is no God, then I can sleep with whoever I want. Darwinism is morally comfortable. Hmm. At least he's being honest, right? Now, is that the motivation for all scientists who are Darwin? No, I don't know. I'm just saying for him it was. Thomas Nagel, who teaches at NYU, said, speaking of Hitchens and Dawkins, they seem to have a cosmic authority problem. In fact, I don't want there to be a God either, he said. 
I don't want the world to be like that. I don't want there to be a God. Remember, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. And a lot of times, scientists have ulterior motives that prevent them from following the evidence where it leads, which is a problem because they are making authoritative statements in our society now. And when we don't counter them, our kids, many of them walk away. And only about a third come back by the time they're age 30. They walk away from the church. So, as Paul said, test all things. Don't believe blindly what Einstein, Behe, or Dawkins or anyone says. Look at the evidence for yourself. Because it's laden with philosophy on all sides of it. And science doesn't say anything scientists do. All right, any questions? By the way, there's more in this in the book. Any questions? For Sean, let's get him the mic, please. Great, um, great talk. I would, uh, I, I'm appreciative of so many people in the room who've helped uh, me think more clearly starting. Greg's uh, comment long ago that I took to heart, which is ask people what they mean by evolution. Mm -hmm. There's an example in science this month of science changing the term again. There's an article on the fruit fly who's a adapted a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria. That bacteria confers an advantage to protect, protect against a fungus, which is killing or hurting the fr fruit mm -hmm. fly. This is now evolution. This is evidence to in, in the journal Science that this is an evolutionary adaptation. And what are they saying? They've adopted a new genome into it. All it is is, is bacteria and the fruit fly living together, but the title is evolutionary adaptation. Mm. And so again, this isn't you know, descent with modification through natural selection. This is using this generic term to sort of uh, uh, gloss this over cloud right. of, yeah, and so right. great example there. Um, like so climate great, change. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one other comment, if we're doing feedback, the, the, the notion of the scientists and why would they do this? Exactly, I see the personal agendas of scientists. We're human and we're all mm -hmm. sinners. I think it would be perfect to walk right into Romans 1, 19 and 20 at that point. Go ahead. I You're mean, still just, on. Yeah. Walk into so, it. So the, <laughs> Romans 1, 19 <laughs> and 20 is, yeah. for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For he is, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Well said. Somebody said that. Paul. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, just a word about bias, and I, get, I owe this observation to J.P. Moreland. Uh, J.P. said that in this enterprise, the scientific enterprise, it would be fair to say that both the Christian and the materialist have biases, if what one means by that is that they have preconceived notions about, about uh, what is possible, and maybe they have come to conclusions about what actually took place. But Buddy points out, and this is the, uh, uh, the observation I think you can take to the bank, the bias of the theist informs the discussion in a different way than the bias of a materialist. The bias of the materialist limits the options, that, uh, the, 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 the kinds of answers that he can come up with in any circumstance. He has got to come up with answers that comport with naturalism and materialism. Okay? The bias of the theist, though, is different. It expands the kinds of explanations that are available to him. He can take and adopt a materialistic explanation if it turns out to be the best explanation for the circumstances. So you hear thunder and you say, well, what is that? Is that the gods bowling? I don't know. Let's check it out. Then you find out that there is a materialistic explanation that's completely adequate to the task. Jesus hit a strike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but he, the, the theist is, has also also has the alternative of a non-materialist or a non-event non, a, a non causation. Uh, they can go to an agent that is outside of the system if the evidence warrants it. So JP's point is that, that the bias of the theist actually allows the theist to follow the evidence where it leads. So his bias, that is his expanded view then, is actually an advantage in discovering the truth, 
where a materialist is not allowed to follow the evidence where it leads. He is only allowed to follow the evidence to a materialistic conclusion. So his bias then, in principle at least, can restrict the pursuit of truth. The Christian's more open-minded. Yes, that's, we're, that's we're, exactly we're, the, we're open to lesson. both causes. We're exactly. open to intelligent and non-intelligent causes. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, well, just to agree with Greg on that, um, Paul Nelson did a talk at Biola a couple of years ago where he was talking about this exact thing, and he was saying, if you're a carpenter, you want all the tools you need in order to do the job, and in essence, what's happening in the uh, origin of life debate is they're taking away a tool where you cannot explain certain things at all, and it you just can't do the job. And uh, Paul Nelson's very good at showing how there's certain things that require intelligence. He does um, some things where, you know, if uh, a band, a uh, marching band spells out cow on the field, that takes prior notion. It's a teleology mm -hmm. um, argument. And he's like, you can't, if you don't have the tool of explaining with intelligence, you can't explain cow on the field. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to agree with Greg on that. Very good. You can explain cow dung, but not cow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And even then, you need an intelligent cow to do that. Yes, go ahead. I, it is very important the way you pointed out there's different types of science. Mm -hmm. The general public has been kind of educated to think that um, science is empirical science and it's proven, both of which aren't accurate. Um, because the thing that they're starting to get in school districts, but only barely, is that there's also HD, hypothetical deductive science, hypothetical inductive science. And um, it's, it's supposed to be taught, like a school district near us, they have it as part of their objectives, but they just, there's maybe one page on it, and they don't really teach it. So if that's brought into the consciousness a little bit better, mm -hmm. they'll realize, or, or the hypocrisy will be exposed a little bit more. But like you called it forensic science, mm -hmm. and but um, it, it it's recognized that there are other types. I mean, most things Einstein did, you know, that he's making, you know, inductions and right. But uh, yes, yeah, so it, it it can also be called origin science, whereas empirical science is called operation science, whatever you want to term it. What's that? Historical. Science. Historical. Historical uh, science is another way of looking at it. Too. When we do New Testament, we're doing historical science, mm -hmm. right? It's still a science. Bobby, you had something. Pass him that back if you would. And just two more, and then we got to take a break for lunch, and then we're going to come back for Richard. Thank you. This is real quick. Um, just from your experience with the, with the whole topic of science, philosophy, in your experience in other churches presenting the Big Bang and whatnot, you had mentioned this yesterday, I believe, pretty quick. Um, do you get much pushback from, from young earthers, you know, 6,000 years versus, uh, you know, millions, billions, uh, Cambrian periods and that kind of thing? Yeah, can you great, explain a little bit? Yeah, what? great question. Here's how I answer it, okay? And uh, you, you can get a lot of hostility. And so I always say, look, I don't know how old the earth is. Could be old, could be young. On Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I think it's old. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I think it's young. And on Sunday, I take the day off. <laughs> the most important point is that there was a creation, not when there was a creation. And I illustrate, I say, the evidence seems to lean more toward an old universe, but you're still making assumptions you can't prove. For example, you have to, prove, you have to assume the speed of light hasn't changed. Principle of uniformity, probably a good assumption, but some are saying they can, they can detect variations in the speed of light now. So I, I'm not 100% sure it hasn't changed. Uh, any other sort of dating method requires assumptions you can't prove, including all the carbon dating methods, uranium dating, decay rates, all have to be assumed. You can't be absolutely sure. With regard to the Bible, uh, does the Bible necessarily teach a young earth? Not necessarily. Why? Because the day yom in, in Hebrew could mean more than 24 hours. It does in Genesis 2-4, where it says the day the uh, Lord created. The sixth day appears to take longer than the uh, than is allotted because Adam names all the animals, right? And Brad Stein, a Christian comedian, has a bit on this. He said, that man, that must have been a long day. In the beginning of the day, Adam was all fired up. He'd see an animal come by. He'd go, rhinoceros! <laughs> then he'd see another one come by. Go, hippopotamus! By the end of the day, <sighs> cow. <laughs> <laughs> He's just had it, you know? <laughs> it seems to take longer. Also, the growth of fruit-bearing plants and all that seems to take longer. And finally, the seventh day, certainly is longer than 24 hours because we're still in the seventh day right now according to Hebrews 4. 
So if the seventh day is longer, maybe the other days are longer, right? On the other hand, it could be 24-hour days. I mean, it could, could teach that it's young. Either way, either way, the more important point is that God created. I can guarantee you this, and this is what I do say to young earthers. I say, you may, you may be right. You may be. Uh, but let me just point this out. If you are right, don't make it a test for orthodoxy for everybody else. Because if you make it a test for orthodoxy for everybody else, you may keep people out of the kingdom because you're saying in order to be a Christian, you've got to be a young earther when some scientist thinks it's, the evidence is much better that it's old. What, are you going to make me check my brains at the door? No, I'm not going to do that. Christianity's false now. And he's rejected the whole thing because of your young earth view. Because I guarantee you this, when you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, do you think it was old or young? Old, you're out of here. No, what did you do with Jesus is going to be the issue, right? So... It's an interesting topic, it's an intramural debate, but I don't think it's something we ought to divide over. I think it's, we ought to just say, look, that God created is more important. Uh, two things to add to that, and these are strategic, so I'm not taking a side here. Uh, those who are young earthers say if you don't take a young earth view that you're undermining the Bible and all of Christianity. Mm -hmm. My experience has been is it's just the opposite. If people have the sense that they have to accept a young earth view of the Bible, they aren't going to take anything in the Bible seriously because mm -hmm. to them that is completely untenable. And so, um, so th there's a strategic concern there. There's a second element of strategic concern. If by, by adopting the Big Bang at face value and then using it in our favor, we are taking something that the other side actually believes is true and leveraging it to our effect. Um, instead of saying there was no Big Bang, we're going to say, okay, let's just pretend that your view is right and let's see where it takes us. Well, your view takes us to our view. <laughs> in other words, your assessment about the begin beginning of the universe is better explained by our world view, not by your world view. Um, the third strategic element, too, is that, that if you, it is hard enough to get people to trust Christ. <laughs> We want to try to have them jump through as few ho hoops as is necessary for them to deal with the real issue, their rebellion against God. Uh, evolution is a big problem. So we're going to try to deal with that and nullify that as a barrier. But if we, in getting people to accept that there might be some problems with evolution, that's a big deal with a lot of these folks. If we got to get them to jump through the hoop of a young earth, do you see how much more difficult we're making the, the, the situation for ourselves. And so from a strategic perspective, I think it's just better to set that on the side, have intramural discussions about that issue, but uh, not make this a point of contention in the, on, the public, uh, on the public stage because it makes our job very much more difficult. Yeah, well, one more question. Yes, go ahead. Shake it. Um, on, on the Cambrian explosion, mm -hmm. every time I've read about that, seen anything about that, like they talk about having every major type of phyla, mm -hmm. but then they always show like these crustacean looking things. Um, does that include like more humanoid type looking structures? <laughs> no, I mean, humans I, I, come I, later. Okay, humans I'm sorry. Come. I mean, I just don't yeah. know anything about right. this. So I mean, I'm trying to figure this all right. out. How does that all fit together with Human, that? Humans come later. Go ahead, Greg. You're gonna say. If you remember from high school zoology, it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So kingdom is the first division, plant and animal, and then the phyla are the next big divisions. The important thing to keep in mind is that in terms of development, all of the major classifications of living things, not every novel feature of living, living things like bipedal locomotion or something like that, but every basic body structure, which is what the phyla describe, is in place at the very beginning, out of nowhere. After that, it's refinements, and some of the refinements are dramatic. So you don't have any bipedal skelet, uh, internal skeleton bone structured things uh, in, the, in the Cambrian explosion. But what you do have is you have a, uh, you have a, a, a dorsal uh, nervous, uh, what do they call it, Dor dorsal um, uh, nerve cord, cordata. I phylum cordata, I guess, is what we are. So all of the creatures that have a... A, a dorsal nerve cord are part of the phylum chordata, and that was established early on. It's good to make this distinction because what we're not saying is that pretty much everything that we see now was there then. What we're saying is that the basic body plans, which is the most foundational level of development, 
were virtually all in place instantaneously in the record and that there's no, been no additional body plans that have been added since then, okay. with maybe a couple of rare exceptions, yeah, see, which I'm is not, exactly I'm not what strong on, on science, and, and every time I've read about this, it hasn't been clear to me what exactly they've meant by that, so thank you. I might want to make one po final point here, and it's a point we made yesterday, but it, it should belong in this presentation too. Even if you grant the atheist macroevolution, again, the atheist doesn't get rid of the need for a designer, because you need a creator and designer to start the universe, to design the universe, yeah. to start and design life, even if after you get the first life you could explain it by some sort of natural process, which as we pointed it out doesn't appear to be the case, but even if that's so, you still got a creator, you still got a designer. And then we mentioned those other immaterial things we talked about, information, morality, reason, those types of things are completely alien to the materialistic worldview. Yet they use those things to argue against it. The very fact that these people have reasons to say that God doesn't exist shows that this is a reasonable world. That reasons matter. And, and say again? That reasons matter. Yeah, that, that reasons the, the matter. The process of reasoning can help us to determine what's true about the world. And if, if they're true, it's, if, if they're right about molecules in motion, then reason doesn't even work. So always back out of this because you can get down in the weeds on this stuff and argue over these particulars and never realize that they're trying to pull weeds with tools they don't have, right? They, they, they just don't have these, these tools in their, in their materialistic worldview, so you gotta back out and show them, even if you're right here, your whole worldview can't, your worldview can't explain all these other things.